think the one thing that makes DMYS particularly unique is the emphasis on the students themselves. Um, you know, conductors, everybody's ego is in check. We have mentors, but the mentors are not there to take first chair positions. They're there to assist the students. Uh, and then when they help on a concert, they're at the back. So everything is very student oriented, student forward. And this is what makes us, I think, particularly unique in a philosophical approach to uh, education and focus. Okay, so. Please get some health food before we start. Now, we did this presentation a la Zoom during the pandemic. Remember that part where we lost our lives and didn't know what was going on? You know, and now it seems like it never happened. And we're back to normal. So, we're going to do this one live. Uh, this is uh, Professor Jeremy Duby, and he's from Olivet College. And he had the great fortune in life to have me as his high school band director. And then the great fortune to have me as his college band director, and the great fortune of going somewhere else by the time he worked on his master's because he had <laughs> enough of me. But anyway, uh, some of you remember him from rehearsal. Yeah. And if you're in concert orchestra, I guess he's going to be running a rehearsal in a couple weeks. Yeah. Anyway, uh, his job at Olivet uh, College, besides being a musician, he also has a symphony orchestra he conducts. And, uh, college band and a community band, so he does a lot of connecting and he has an administrative position too. And what we're very concerned about is the fact that a lot of you, you know, you've spent all this time working on music and making it a part of your life and then you go to college and then you want to do something else and then you just throw it out. So what we want to let you know is the things you can do, whether you're going to be a music major or not, and the things you should look forward to and watch when you get ready to apply for a college. So how many are applying for a college and we got to do all that stuff, yeah. I suppose if you're a senior, you've already done that, you know, <coughs> so we're hoping to guide you through some of this stuff. So, I'll let Mr. Dewey take it away. Great. Yeah. So I'll throw things around as, as well, because Doug and I have been in this trench for quite some time um, on, on the side. And then if you guys want to introduce yourselves, yes. just so we can... Sure. Um, I'm Quentin Jensen. I've been working here with the Brass for, for two years now. Um, I'm a graduate as of a couple days ago from Wayne State for music education. Um, so I've been doing a lot of performance opportunities, I've been doing a lot of uh, teaching opportunities, and then there's just a whole other world of all sorts of other stuff that we'll talk about as well. Yeah. All right, and my name's Elise. Um, I'm a DMYS alum. I was in the orchestra for six years. Um, and now I'm a sophomore at the University of Toledo. I am not a music major. I am in engineering and um, sustainability is, is my background right now in school, um, but I am a non-major still involved in music, so I'm getting a music scholarship to be in the orchestra um, and still keeping music in my life that way. And so I'm going to just talk a little bit about that and how to balance, you know, if you don't want to major in music, what that looks like. Yep. Cool. Yeah, and then at any time if you want to chime in on something, go for it. Cause so we got the a a music major and the music major. Yeah. And they shouldn't be too... Uh, too humble. For example, he is the first uh, trumpet player in the bands and the jazz band. You know, so he, they know what's going on. Same with Lisa. I mean, she has a lot of pedigree there, I feel a, a lot of professional experience. So here we go. So this really came from a place of, like Doug said, I, I work at Olivet College, and when I started at Olivet College, there wasn't really a music program existing. There were nine students in the band, that was it. They had a long history of a, a rich music program, but it had kind of gone dormant for a while. So in that time, I started a marching band, and I, I put the band back on the map. We're starting to talk about reinstituting the orchestra. Choral programs have grown extensively. Um, but what we have found was that working with the admissions department and working with students in the recruitment process, there are a lot of questions you all have and your families have about what this all means and what it is. And then we started finding there's a lot of stereotypes out there, too, about what it means to be in a college music program um, at any sort of level. And so we kind of wanted to take that fear and anxiety off the map and kind of break it down for you to kind of show you the things that were, you know, what actually goes on in, in this case. Um, and as much as we want to talk about the non-majors, it's important to understand what the degrees are and that they, they are offered as well um, so that you can double major in things like this if you, if you have that kind of desire. You can even minor in music while pursuing much other things, right? And so 
that's something that you should know. So they're, basically we're splitting this down. There's a Bachelor of Arts in Music, and that's something that we offer at Olivet, being a small liberal arts college. Um, more for students that pursue a double major or wish to have more of the academic-focused education. Um, a lot of music ed majors now are, are Bachelor of Arts, um, but there's a lot of other things like music critic, music librarian, a lot of things. We'll have some lists uh, to show you some of those ideas as well. But just if, if it's more academically focused, you're probably going to go in the Bachelor of Arts. It's a little lighter of rigor in the performance aspect of that in the degree. That That's where you're, uh, like if you were very interested in being a musicologist, yeah. and you, we were interested in and studying Baroque music and going over to Vienna and some library and doing papers. And, that was traditionally what a Bachelor of Arts would be. And in fact, at Wayne State, we started one just five, 10 years ago, somewhere in that area. Uh, <coughs> because there were one, students that weren't, didn't have a lot of prowess on their horn, but they were very interested in theory and history and all that kind of stuff. So there's that. You still have to play. Yeah, there's still, there's still that rigor of performance, but not as heavy as the Bachelor of Music, which is very intensive curriculum in the music performance aspect um, through, the, through the bachelor degree. Right. And ed, ed degrees can be a bachelor of music as well. I don't mean to say that the ed degree is only a BA, but, but they fall in both categories. But there's much, much more emphasis on the actual performance aspect in the bachelor of music. Okay, and then there's a bachelor of music education. So if you want to teach music, that is a separate degree. Um, and you want to be careful when you're looking for programs like this because there's a lot of new pathways out there um, to involve yourself in education, which I think is great. If you're one of those people that goes into school and you start doing the thing and then you're like, you know what, I think I can do this teaching thing, then that pathway program that's out there is great. It's an, it's an outside program that's postgraduate that you can take some classes while you're actually teaching in the classroom and then they get you certified and you go on, right? But if you know right up on front that you want to be a music educator, Find an institution that has a music education degree, because you'll get you'll get that in your four years, five years, and you'll be through that process. Right? Right, because you're, it, when you're done with that degree, then you will be certified. Correct. You know that's the difference. Certified, degreed, and ready to go. You can take a full time job anywhere and not have to do any extra work or pay any extra money. Right. Um, to, for for the initial B. <laughs> yeah. okay. And you know. A lot of this is changing, so make sure that you ask if that's something you want to do when you're looking at an institution and ask to talk to somebody within the department. There's a lot of certification that is required. There's a, a pre-exam that has to be taken before you get into the education department, um, but it's an intensive study within music and education, so it's a partnership. So you'll have music ed courses within the music curriculum, but then you'll also have to take courses within the College of Ed. Most of these places are going to have a secondary admission process, in this case two, okay, because you're going to have to also apply for the the College of Education or the Program of Education, depending on the institution you're in. All music programs are going to have a secondary. Uh oh, what did I do? All music programs are going to have a secondary admission process, right? We have to we have to pass an audition, right? And then this is that PRE test that we have to take to get into the Ed program. And then there's student teaching involved at the end of that program, where you're going to be side by side with a master teacher teaching that music. And then it's always important to recognize, too, I mean, we all go into this idea, like, I'm gonna, if, if you're on that path, then we say, I'm going to go teach high school, I'm gonna, I want to teach middle school, I'm going to teach this thing. Music certification is K-12 music. So once you graduate this degree, it's a, it's, a, it's a blessing and a burden, right? Because you can teach any level of music at any kind of music. So you could be the, the best violinist in the world, right? But your first job could be an elementary choir class, right? You're certified to do that. But on the flip side, it's great, because when you get a job, you're marketable within a district. You can cover more things and stay full time. By the way, most programs have a secondary admission. That just means that by the time you're done your sophomore year, uh, they check your grade point and your progress and all that, and you then get to be senior standing. All right, and that means we're pretty sure you're going to get through this, and you can go on. And then they charge you more money per credit. But that's another show. I'm going to move through this one because I always get stuck on this slide because there's lots of cool things I'm here to talk about. So I'll just throw these up here and then you can ask questions if you want and then we can get into the nuts and bolts of actual auditions and scholarships and financial aid and all that stuff. But these are just some things that you can do with a, whoops, with a music degree. And this is not an extensive list necessarily. But there are a lot of options. And especially with the Bachelor of Music and Bachelor of Arts, that gives you a lot of 
variants here, right? Running with the music shop, the insurance industry. So all of that is actually known for its insurance program. I had no idea that was an actual degree until I started working there. And we're like the top three programs for insurance and risk management in the country. Um, and we partner with them really well in the music program, actually, with our business program. So students can go in there and then, you know, insuring instruments, you know, people like the Detroit Symphony members have really, 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 really expensive instruments, as you know, right? So you have to insure that stuff. That's a big industry. Um, so that's something that you can get into as well. Uh, musicology, as we offered, music librarianship, that's also a really big job. I don't think people always realize how big of a deal that is. Um, and that's something like a BA would do for you as well. Um, producing music, conducting music, all these, all these types of things. The military, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, that's another avenue for you outside of college. You can get into the military ensembles. They're running auditions all the time, so you can find a recruiter, get in. Um, the basic training level of military groups is, is less than the standard uh, basic training, so, so you can know that. You do go through some, but you don't have, it's not as intense as like the, the gunners and things. Um, but it is important to know, and I found this out the hard way through a student. Um, I have a student that actually plays, she's second horn in the president's own. Um, and I have a couple of other students in other military bands within the Army and the Air Force. Um, the, the premier bands, like the president's own, the Air Force, the Army uh, field band, those are called premier bands. If you make it into the premier band, that's your job, period. Your job is to serve the country and in the president's own in the Marine Corps to serve the White House, right? You don't do anything else. But you can audition into these military music programs and then get placed at a fort somewhere or a base somewhere. And then it's important that you know that you're going to then be given a secondary uh, profession, right? So whatever it is, if it's mechanic or whatever. And then if we get called to serve, you will be an active duty member, right? So you may play in a band at a, at a base, but unless you're in one of the premier groups, you're going to be well-rounded in that case. And there's also an intensive music school that goes through that too. So you may pass an audition with a recruiter, and then you have to go to music school and pass all the tests before you actually get placed into an ensemble. So those are the things they don't tell you on the front. I had a former student who uh, ended up in Afghanistan, and one of his jobs was something to do with kitchen room. And then they would give these concerts for the for the you know, military servicemen there. And, uh, he showed me a film of the, the Christmas concert, and they were playing the Nutcracker and all this kind of stuff, and they were a band of like five of them. Yeah. So it's not always that glamorous, but you know, you, you never know. Yeah. yeah. I do want to say at Wayne State we have music education. You can get jazz performance. We have music tech, um, music business. And what's the one? Oh, and then performance. Yeah. So you want to check out what schools have the program that's going to fit for you. And music tech is definitely a big one. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of a breeze through. Does anybody have any questions about majoring? Cool. So moving through then, what if you're not a major, right? And this is the important crux of, I think, this, this presentation, right? So. Institutions offer ensembles for non-major participation. Okay, so I, I think that we get in our head the, the major universities, the major colleges, we think about what those main ensembles are because those are the ones that get marketed, right? The Wind Symphony at Wayne State is going to be the one that you see when you get a commercial or you get a flyer, right? The Olivet College Wind Ensemble is the thing you're going to see. But there are other ensembles around that as well. That's why we have a flourishing department, right? And we also recognize the value and the importance of, of musicians totally. Right? Not just for your sake, it's always better to keep playing in music and keep being involved in those ensembles. I'm going to show you some stats on that, why that's important. But also because it also helps the institution. We need the non-majors in our ensembles and in our program because that's what keeps us flourishing. Okay? So you always want to make sure that you check that out when you're looking at colleges. Marching band for the, for the wind players and percussion players, that's, that's another avenue and that's usually a big one for institutions. That's usually the money draw. And it's also another one of those visual draws that institutions look for, right? By the way, the, for example, I think that U of M marching band has 93% uh, non-major. Yes. When you see that band on the field at a U of M football game, it's almost all non-major. It's very competitive to get in, into, right? Yeah. They die to get into it. But hey, we have to travel, have a good time. Right. And, all that. and the interesting thing is when you look at those and then they have their alumni, day, their alumni game days or whatever else. It's interesting to see the alumni that show up because again, that number then carries over. So you like, the best heart surgeon in the world is out there playing saxophone on Saturday, you know, you feel it. So it's just interesting to see. 
So auditions are an important process. This is that secondary <coughs> admissions process, right? You have to audition to get into a music program. Um, some are more competitive than others, depending on the institution that you're going to, right? But the audition is still going to be the crux. It does a couple of things. It lets us know on the faculty and staff where you are as a musician, right? And I want you to keep that in mind, because sometimes the audition isn't as cutthroat as we like to think about it. You're not auditioning to get into the Detroit Symphony. You're auditioning to get a degree or to play and, and participate in an ensemble, right? So it's a two-way street at that point. You're going to audition and show us what you have so that as directors we can decide, is that going to fit into the ensemble that I need, that I'm running? Is it an instrument that I need, and are you good enough to make that cut, right? I mean, if I'm having an orchestra audition, I have 45 violin players but only two spots open this semester, right? Then, then there's a little bit more edge, right? But in some of the institutions I know, like at Olivet, I'm looking for, am I able to work with you, and are you going to be able to grow in our ensemble, right? Where are you starting at? Um, and so that's what that audition process is about. It's also important for you to go through the process because you want to see how we operate. What's our professionalism in that room? How is the feel of the space and the, in the process so that when you get into the ensemble, is that something that you're going to be comfortable playing in? Right? So we want to keep that in mind. Every program is going to have a list of requirements for the audition. Some institutions actually have pieces listed. Play this, right? Others are going to be a little bit more open to you and just say anything like, okay? Usually it's one or two pieces of contrasting style, okay? And then there'll be some, some uh, suggestions. Uh, scales are always going to be a part of that, and a little bit of sight reading are always going to be part of that, right? Um, I always advise students, too, like if you're involved with MSBOA solo and ensemble, all of that is, is basically your audition, right? Anything that's good enough for a solo and solo and ensemble is going to be sufficient for an audition. The scales, you know, I typically just run from those proficiency scales at State Solo and Ensemble, and they're listed on our website uh, for our music requirements. Um, usually proficiency two for non-majors and proficiency three for majors. We expect the majors to know all the scales. Yes? For an audition, do you have to do the ABRSM grading with the requirements for getting for music school? Or no? I think it depends on the institution. Yeah. For like yeah. Wayne State, Michigan State, do you have to do any of that? That you'd have to check in on their program. Okay. But yeah, I'm. I don't. I'm not the expert. Yeah. So let's say something right now. Okay. When you go to look for a school and you know you're getting good grades, most of you are pretty high achievers, and I don't mean that in a negative way. That's a good thing, right? And you worked on your music, and you're good at calculus, and you want to go what? There's like U of F. Or my son went to U of F. That's like one of the greatest schools in the nation. They have over 800 people audition. Right? And it is very tight. Um, I went to an MSU concert that happened to be their last concert about 10 years ago. And the director said, oh, this is our last concert, so I'd like to introduce the students. So uh, the undergrads, I want them to stand in the pot. There's like two. Oh. Master students, about like 20. Doctoral students, another 20. Yeah, you're talking about like up here. And nobody else lives by those standards, OK? So, you know, you just need to know what you're dealing with, okay? You've probably heard of Harvard and Yale. Yeah, it's really hard to get into Harvard and Yale. Not everyone works like Harvard and Yale, okay? Just so you right. know. And going to the school, taking a lesson with the teacher makes a big decision. One of the best trumpet players I ever had, outside of Quinton, when he said, <laughs> actually took a lesson at uh, U of M, got accepted, but he, he didn't like the chemistry between his teacher and him. So he, he went away. He took a lesson, you know, with the teacher and said, oh, I like this. And, and that's, that's how that works. So just keep that in your mind. You, what, 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 uh, your SAT scores, you got a scholarship and all that kind of stuff. Yes. And you went to Toledo. Yes. Yeah. yeah. People would say, Toledo? Yeah. The first horn player in the Detroit Symphony graduated from Toledo. All right? And he never got a master's or a doctoral degree anywhere. That's all he did. And I looked at his resume once, because he was using it for my wife as a model, you know? I said, you can't use this. Just that I went to Toledo, I did this and that. <laughs> but he was so brilliant at his playing, you know? Uh, he, you know where he ended up. So just get this idea of the school is, you know, if you don't go to like a Big Ten school or something like that, that you're somehow in a lesser category. But they do operate differently. Okay. Yeah, there was a question, sorry. Are there any music majors 
that like you can play multiple instruments? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ed, of course, you have to play all of them, right, at some level. And usually you're going to have a secondary instrument that's going to be your next primary if you're an Ed major, right? So you'll play in a multiple ensembles anyway um, to cover that. Uh, uh, well, I mean, we get the students all the time. Some play a string instrument, they play a wind instrument, and they just, you know, they go where the money is. Right. You know, some places offer money. Like at Wayne State, we have what's called an activity award money. I can give you money each semester that's got nothing to do with a scholarship just to help out. And then you came in and said, you know, hey, I play bassoon. It's like, we need, yeah, we need a bassoon. Okay, go for it. Yeah, and then you can do that. Uh, again, you have a lot more uh, flexibility than some of the other. Uh, they're smaller schools. Another thing to remember, and I'm sure you'll cover this, but when you go to U of M and MSU, you are attending a school of music. They have their own dean, they have their own, it's a school of music. When you go to Wayne State or Oakland University, it is a department of music. It's within a college that's within a university. You get the pecking order, how that works? When you go to a U of M, you go to the school of music. Okay, that's its own thing. So something to keep in mind yeah. too. Which is usually then in the College of Fine Arts or Arts and Humanities, which is within the university, right? And I think that that's also important to remember when, from my perspective, because I teach at all that college. That's it, we're a college. We have departments within the college, right? Because we're smaller, we're liberal arts, which means that the degree covers, it's more, it's that Bachelor of Arts that we talked about. So it's more open and academic. So students are involved in multiple things. They're getting various areas of study with a concentration on whatever their major is going to be at that point, right? So when you're looking for schools, that's something that's important to keep in mind um, because of that because of that pecking order. So how big do you want to go? We are going to talk about that in a second. But how big do you want and how small do you? And you can tell right away by the name of the institution what, <coughs> what you're looking at, right? And I just want to add really quickly, as we're talking about these huge schools that are really selective and hard to get into, um, if you have your heart set on U of M or Harvard or wherever, um, there are other orchestras than that one that's made up of all doctoral students. So it's not like just because you want to go to this school for something else, you can't be in music because it's so selective for their music program. I have friends who are in computer science at U of M but are playing in chamber orchestras there. So you know it's still possible to keep going even if you want to go to that big school. Yeah, actually the bigger schools have more offerings, right. Right? right? So at Wayne State, you can be a non-major and be in the top band or in the orchestra, right? right. Uh, you, that would never happen at U of M. Right. You know, it's most exclusive for music students. However, like in the band program, we got like four or five of them. You go to a place like Indiana, you know, you have five bands, three orchestras, you can you can have that experience. Yep. I'm sure you're going to cover more of that. It's, I think it's another important point that Doug just made, too, because what kind of experience you want may dictate the schools that you look at. Like we having gone through this, Elise, for example, said, I'd like to play with the music majors. She wanted to be in orchestras where those top students were still working on music, so the caliber was very high. So that is one path, right? Or there are other paths, you can a lot of ways. The other thing to jump in, Makai is at um, Oakland, and to your point, he was just commenting <coughs> on the number of students that yeah, multi we, instruments. So in our chamber works, just so it's a class that you can sign up for. We, I would say, over over half of our students in our chamber works are non majors, or either a minor. And even in our Oakland City workshop, which is at Oakland, it's not a student. It is a student orchestra, but it's a student orchestra and also professional orchestra combined. So you'll have your faculty will play in the orchestra with you, or you'll have individuals who audition from outside of the program and get into it and play. So there are so many different opportunities where even if you're not a non-major, you can still be in these top orchestras. Because I have friends now that recently just auditioned to get into the orchestra are now going to be playing our concert coming up. So there are so many different opportunities that the schools have you, you just have to really kind of search for them sometimes. In the, you know, my orchestra and the symphony orchestra, it's a combination majors and not majors. Um, you know, I think of the front row of students, the principals, of out of the six of us, I think five are engineering majors. So like, you know, it, it definitely, you can still be involved, even if you're in like a rigorous STEM major, if you're doing something else, it's, it's still very possible. Yeah, and I'll say to close that, on some, in some institutions, like at Olivet especially, you know, depending on what kind of program you're going into, you could have different opportunities. So in a smaller program, you're going to have leadership opportunities like immediately, mm -hmm. 
right, and different things. And in all of that, we have a flute ensemble that's student run. I have a brass ensemble that's student run. We have an a cappella choir group that's student run. Um, and they've just kind of made their own club. Right? They're just like, we want to do this. Great, have at it, you know? Um, and then they get faculty support, and we help guide them through their rehearsals and things and help polish those little things. But that's something they wanted to do. We didn't have one available for class, so they made one up, right? And that's, that's something that you can do. And even at some of the larger institutions, sometimes you have that opportunity to like, set these chamber ensembles and such, right? Another big question and concern I get from families is, you know, can I make it in a college ensemble? Do I have time for a college ensemble? And the answer, of course, is yes, right? Um, don't. Don't let the, the stigma get into you that you're now at this university or college and so all of a sudden life is different. You know, the, the light, I lighten it up when I talk to families all the time and say, listen, orchestra is orchestra is orchestra. Band is band is band. Choir is choir is choir. Like, it's, you're already ingrained in the culture, right? So the faces are gonna be different, obviously, when you get there. You're gonna be playing with new people. But guess what? Rehearsal runs exactly the same way as it's run for you the past 12 years you've been doing it, right? Um, and so I think that that's an important thing to know. Another side of that is that, you know, you've already put the time in. You've already put that, that level in, right? And so much like this organization, you're going to be in a university or a college group that with people like-minded and people that want to be there, right? We've all been in our school ensembles, and there's always some people that are there, and you're like, what? Like, do you like playing music? What, is, what are you doing, right? So that's why we seek out these other opportunities. When you're at the college level, you're always going to have the people, that's what they're there for, right? The majors are there, they have to be there, and they're invested in it because that's what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. So you have very serious people involved with you, right? The non-majors are there because they want to keep playing, right? And so you have a group of people like-minded that want to continue the art, want to keep going. And so there's never that downtime of like, oh, why can't so-and-so practice, right? Because when that happens, then you're out, okay? Um, and the time commitment is no more than you're already used to, right? And I think that's important too that we're going to, the kind of common theme is keep going. Just keep going. You put all this talent and time into your instruments and into your craft. Now is not the time to give it up. And what you'll actually find, much like this organization, right, when you get to the college, is just taking it to the next level. So the, the one thing I tell my students, if, if anything is different, it's that the learning curve is a little quicker. Right? You're not necessarily going to have rehearsal every day like you did in high school. Right? It's going to be probably two times a week, maybe three times a week. Okay? But it's going to move faster. And because you have everybody there that's, that's invested in it, it is, it's able to move faster. Right? But that's just something to keep in mind. Don't neglect the practice room because you have that time. And that's the big thing college students learn right away with all of their classes. You have time between classes now. So don't neglect the, the study time and the, and the practice time. Right? But the point is that that would be the major difference, I would say, is that it just moves a little quicker, and you're probably going to give a few more performances than you're used to giving because of that. But you're going to be playing higher level lit, and, and you're taking your talent to the very next level. So our job at the collegiate level, especially with the non-major groups, that's what I tell my students all the time. You got to this point. My job now is to take you to the next level of, of your performance ability, right, and mature that a little bit, okay? You're going to have a better understanding of your performance, of your music, and the things that you're doing. Um, so that you can keep going, and then you can take that craft with you beyond the, the class. Maybe this is a good time to uh, talk about the medical orchestra. There are ensembles at colleges, some of the bigger ones, that only meet one day a week. All right? You just had that one rehearsal week. And are any of you thinking going in the medical profession? All right? And what you want to do is you want to seek out, um, there's, there's this group of, of, of organizations around all the big universities they have what they call the medical orchestra. And that's all the people that go into the medical profession uh, but play an instrument and still want to keep it up. Uh, and these are pretty fantastic, usually musicians and really, I mean, come on, they're going to be doctors, right, and surgeons and all that. And they want that release, so they'll have an orchestra that meets one day a week. And um, it's primarily for people in the medical school, because like at Wayne State, it's a huge thing, our medical program. U of M, huge medical school. They have their own orchestra. They meet one day a week and they just play great stuff. You know, they'll do like a Mahler symphony and everyone gets out their instruments and you'll be playing next to some surgeon, doctor, that's probably one of your professors and then uh, other people in the program. And because there's so many people going in that profession that studied like you do. And, you know, uh, can you make it in an ensemble? Yes, many of you play just so well already. Uh, seniors, like, there's nobody that wouldn't want you. And, and just to capitalize on, during the said, you know, well, earlier in my career, I had these two girls 
after the prom. It's in June. And I'm like, I'm, I'm done with these high school boys. I'm going to college a couple months, and I'm going to find a college man. And I said, you do realize the difference between a high school boy and a college man is three months. <laughs> All right? It's like, they're not going to be any different until they're about 42. OK, let's just say that. So, You'll find yourself being able to go right into that. It's uh, like when you went from middle school to junior high to high school, it was a little late. But when you got in that group, you were a part of a, a group already with upperclassmen. You found out where the bathrooms were and how everything works, and it was that comforting thing. When you join an ensemble at college, it's just like getting into a fraternity, a sorority. You're already part of college life. You know, it's just a lot of a lot of fun. So, and some of you are dang good. You could be having a lot more fun when you got to college. So uh, I find that when people, uh, students would go from junior high to high school, they actually say, I like this so much better. You know, so much more advanced, you go to college, you're like, I like this so much better. Oh yeah, that, that's over that way too. And I think that that, you know, the environment always enhances what your ability is, right? So I think that you'll find when you get into that environment, all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, all this stuff I've been working on is like natural, right? And now I can just keep working to, to update that and keep going, but I'm around people that are inspiring to, to continue, yeah. right? Nobody's in a college orchestra that's going to say, yeah, I take this class because my mom made me because right. she bought the instrument. No, <laughs> right. That left in the middle school, all right? And, and we found, too, like, one of my big points this year with my students was because they were shocked we were, we were a smaller group this, this year, but we sounded like we were the full band everybody was used to. And it's because, also, as you age, your body's now able to do the things that we've been teaching you for all these years, right? Um, so wind players, all of a sudden, you find that, wow, I have all this space in my lungs. I have the support from it, right? And then also we have the ability on our instrument um, and the muscle tone and everything for the finesse, right? And so that's, that's an important part. The, the other thing I'll say about auditions is you are all in really great shape, right? Because you're in this organization. So guess what? You're already used to the audition process. You're already used to going through these things, right? When you fill out the registration form or the application for an audition wherever it is you go, guess what? People like us running the audition look for that stuff. I see MDYS on, on, the, on the form. You're in, basically. Just don't come in and screw up, <laughs> right? But the point is, like, I'm excited to see you and hear your audition and talk with you further, and I'm already salivating over offering you the financial aid and getting you to deposit and getting you into my on ensemble, right? So you need to know that going in, right? Don't slough it off. But the point is that you have the experience that people are looking for. So any institution is already going to say, yes, I want you in my ensemble. It's a matter of where you're going to fit best at that point, right? Um, and then also, you, your nerves are probably going to be a lot easier task because you're already used to the audition. You had an audition to get into the organization. And now you're already auditioning to keep your chair and to move chairs and do all these other things. Yeah, you right? do solo ensemble. Yeah. The Suzuki guys, you give them recitals since you were four. <laughs> you know, you, you got the equipment. Yep. So you're in really great shape. Um, and then, this doesn't really, I think, work too much with you guys. But, you know, when you get the results, have a conversation with, with the people that are offering you critique and or acceptance, right? And if you don't get accepted somewhere, it's okay to ask for feedback. Right? Because if you're in a larger institution that's that competitive, it's good to know what they're looking for specifically, and then maybe it is something you can brush up on and do better in your next audition. Right? Um, and if it's, you know, if you are in, it's not a bad thing to even ask again, you know, so that you can continue getting better when you're in the ensemble. That also tells the audition people that you're serious about the, the process and the endeavor. And, that, and the, you know, there are students that after their, their two years at one place, give it a go someplace else they want it to go. Just felt they needed a little more experience. Yeah, that's not odd either. Mm -hmm. So just going into an audition, just you know the the usual reminders, and it's it's like the old rule with those warning signs on ladders, right? It's like if it's written down, it's because somebody did it. You know, you know. So as, as silly as some of it seems, we, we can't take common sense for granted anymore. So it is an audition. It is an interview. So you want to dress appropriately, dress up, take it with confident body language, even if you are nervous. Just go in there like you own the place, you know. Be, be the brilliant musician that you are. Um, we know you're nervous, right? So it's just a matter of just kind of giving us that idea. So an ensemble, auditions here, these are all practice and mock audition processes for you. And, you know, those of you that do have stage fright or get nervous, it's, that's the biggest thing. You know, Doug can tell you stories later, but the, the point is, like, the only way to really get over it is to keep throwing yourself into it, right? I used to shake violently when I got in front of people, right? I mean violently. Yeah. Um, and thanks to this man, like, 
now I don't even think about it, right? But he just kept pushing me in front of groups, right? So yeah, I made him do what? I made him play the Star Spangled Banner by himself on the podium of the entire marching band because for some reason I got ticked off. I can't even remember. But by the way, yours truly is the same way. Yeah, just violently, violently shaking. Like, yeah. I can't play because yeah. I'm shaking. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and you know what? We've all been there. So it's okay when you're nervous in a spot, especially in something like a college audition. It's, it seem, to you, it's going to seem high stake at that point, right? Because maybe that's your dream to get into that program, right? And that's okay. We do understand that as the panel. Um, but that's why we do all these kind of practice things to get out ahead of that as best as possible. Private lessons are always good. I, most of you probably are already involved. You could do local lessons like you've been doing. And then I would, I would advise, we hinted at this a little bit earlier, if you're looking at an institution that you want to be a part of, call the department and ask for a lesson with, the, with whoever is teaching that instrument, right? Most of them will agree, you'll probably have to pay for it, but, but some don't. If, it's, if they know it's your prospective student, sometimes they'll give you a lesson, right? But the point is, you want to know, again, if that's the right fit for you. You know, so, so maybe Doobie Academy is the, is the institution you want to be at, and that's where you've always wanted to be. You know, but, but the horn instructor is a jerk, right? If it's not a good fit for you, you don't, you don't want to be there. And that's the best way to find out, right? And then also on some of these places, go attend their concert. Go see what the ensemble's like, right? How do they play? How do they take a stage? What's the decorum, right? Try to, try to reach out to the conductor and see, you know, what that experience is like, right? Um, and have those conversations. Because, you know, the, the truth is when you go to an institution, it's, it's just as much you want to be the right fit and comfortable there as much as we want to be there, right? And so you want to make sure you're making the right choice that way. a quick thing. If you're going to write a professor, all right, oh, yeah. don't start with hey, nope. all right? <laughs> and the, the I pronoun is capitalized. No run on sentences. <laughs> Do spell check. <laughs> because you may think you're just, you're not sending somebody a text. You're just saying, this is me. This is who I am. You only know me by this name. So this is what I'm all about. It makes a big difference. You'd be surprised. Yeah. And a closer, you know, thank Sin you. Sincerely. Sincerely. Yeah. And then your name, right? And then it's always important to, even if you are sending me the email, like include a contact information under your name, right? Because sometimes that email domain doesn't work. We all have so high security networks on our school emails anymore, it's ridiculous. So sometimes I can't even get back to you, right? So leave me a phone number, leave me something there so that they know how to get back in touch with you. Lose it. Also, one thing that I did, which really helped me, was I created an email signature, mm -hmm. and you'll see, like, when I send emails now, it has my name, it has my profession, what I do, it has my the best email to reach me, at, and of course a phone number, so that not only do you write it in your email, but then they have that too, so they can see it even bigger, so that it stands out, so that they know exactly where to reach you at. Yeah, but this is really important. You all laugh, but like the amount of emails we get, where I'm just I, I'm not even responding to this. You know, and, and frankly, sometimes you, you'll even get a nasty one back. Like, I have written emails back going, when you can write a proper email, I'll answer you, right? Um, you just have to, you, you have to be professional in that, in that manner. I've sent that to colleagues, too, unfortunately, but that's the way. <laughs> so public versus private institutions. Um, there is a difference. So tuition is, is the main factor in, on that. Public institutions are funded by the state, okay? So tuition's probably going to be a little lower. Um, and there's going to be more aid available for students as you apply and go through that process, right? Because there's a subsidy coming into that institution, okay? A private institution, they're funded by tuition dollars and, and grants, okay? Um, so the, the tuition dollar is probably going to be a little higher uh, because that's how we pay the bills, right? So all of that college is a private institution, um, and so we have that. However, don't let that fool you. Because everybody has a ton of aid packages and other availabilities that we can offer different breaks to, right? So, and it's important when you're looking at institutions, and I can't stress this enough, look at the breakdown of the numbers. It's all a game. It really is all a game. So when you're looking at the financial aid, the, you may see like, look, I'm getting $45,000 in scholarship from this institution, and I'm only getting $20,000 in scholarship from this institution, so I'm going to go here. But look at the rest of the line items, because in the long run, sometimes they, they're giving you more aid on the front, which can include grant and scholarship, but oftentimes loans get slipped into part of that aid because it's money that's coming to you, okay? And so it looks like you're getting a ton of money off the cost, but in the long run, you're actually paying way more 
in tuition dollars and other fees, okay? And then the nickel and diming of fees, right? So don't always get sticker shock on how much you're getting. Make sure that you look at the entire uh, offer and figure out what your cost is going to be long term. And be careful of the loans, okay? The federal loans are usually going to be packaged no matter where you go. That's kind of a given. And a lot of institutions, we have to package them on the front. That's just how it works with the rules, okay? And then you're going to have the interest rates and all that stuff that you're going to have to look at. But some institutions are going to pile a couple other loans on there in, in, under the guise of its aid. Okay, so you want to be careful when you're looking at some of those things. You, when you talk to an admissions rep, when you talk to a financial aid counselor at those institutions, they will walk you through it. But sometimes you have to be a little bit more firm to say, can you walk me through this process and let me know what these dollars are, right? Just so that you see. Because sometimes one looks more expensive than it really isn't. Yeah. Class sizes are going to be different between public and private. Public are going to have larger classes and larger campuses. So we talked about those, the, the hierarchy of college, university, college, school, right? where small colleges are going to be much smaller. The ratio of student to professor at Olivet, for instance, is 1 to 16. So, yeah. So it's every 16 students is one professor, right? You go to U of M, there's going to be 300 people in a lecture hall, right? I, I know, I mean, obviously as a music director, we know every, every student in our ensembles, right? Or in the music program, I know every student by name. But at a place like Olivet, I know probably three quarters of the student population on campus who aren't even involved in music, right? But just because we have that small class size and through other courses and things that we have to cover, we get to know each other, right? That's helpful for you professionally, right, if you're looking at certain degrees and things because I can write a letter of recommendation like nobody else because I really know that student, right? It's not just somebody that took my class. It's somebody that I got to know while teaching that class and usually then comes back for help after that class, right? So things to be aware of. Degree offerings are going to differ between public and private as well. A um, lot more offerings at public institutions and a lot more subcategories usually within that as well just because of structure. If I have a school of business or a school of music, then I can do a whole lot more with, with what I'm doing, right? If I'm already at a small college or private institution, it's going to be more direct focus on, on a couple of things within that. And like I said earlier, that Bachelor of Arts, that liberal arts type curriculum is a little bit more broad. So you have the option to, to focus on a few more things. So there's going to be less options within that because we have to handle that workload. And then looking at financial aid, and this is the important part on this process, make sure that you file your FAFSA, okay? Because this tells the institutions all the financial stuff behind you. Yes? Would you have any idea when like colleges start giving the financial aid packages? Because I haven't gotten, like, Oh, you won't for what? Okay. Um, well, like, for, like, what? We've already sent ours. So I, it depends on where you're applying. So like my main school is right now is Central, and I never heard anything back, like if they even got my FAFSA. Okay, so, so two things there. One, you can call your admissions rep, if you, if you should have one, right? Or call the Office of Admissions <laughs> and, and check on that. Two, you can check your FAFSA file. So there are, you put your top three choices in FAFSA. And that's who they share the information with. If you're really looking at Central, make sure that Central is listed as your top choice, number one. Okay? And then that will help expedite that process. Okay. Everybody's going to have a little bit different timeline. The smaller colleges, I know we scramble. We try to get the first aid package out in October um, or by December at the latest. I think now FAFSA opens in October, so we've shifted a little bit. Um, the large institutions might take a little bit more time. But the big deciding factor is where you have them listed in your school choice on your FAFSA form. You might want to double check that because sometimes FAFSA does some weird things. Because like I've heard back from Grand Valley and um, Western, like I know they've seen it. Okay. But I haven't gotten any offer like That's, packages. Okay. Yeah. So I would check the FAFSA and I would call the admissions office okay. and see what's up. Um, yeah. I just had a student that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, got their FAFSA back from Central a month ago, okay. and they did it day one. They they set everything up day one. Um, so yeah, if you could end up talking to their financial aid office too, that's probably the most direct line to just get it taken care of. Because okay. it sounds like it's an issue on their end, uh, as long as you send it. Yeah, yeah, and actually I should say that I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about when you audition and they're going to give you money. Oh yeah. Th that's what I was talking about, because at Wayne we have, for example, audition next week. Then we have February 1. 
and uh, and those you have to like, check the college because those two, if you want to get a scholarship, you have to audition one of those dates, right? Yeah. Then we have a main kind of mop up one, but you can't get any money if you do that. But the other thing you have to remember is that there's a thing called the letter of intent, okay? And it works just like the sports people, okay? Um, there's a deadline, but usually it's like May 1st. And when you commit um, to, say, Central, Central says, we'll give you this much money, you have this other stuff taken care of, but we'll give you this music scholarship. If you accept it, after that deadline, you may not go to another college and take money or get a better deal. You are bound by that contract, that letter of intent. In other words, it's the same if someone says, I'm going to play for Michigan State, I'm on the run, and you send your letter of intent, this is where I'm going. Once that deadline passes, you can't all of a sudden go to a different school. So you may not right. do that. And believe me, they keep tabs. So if you try to jump ship, and get more money after the deadline, that institution will be ethic, you know, ethically um, suspect, and they can't do it. So that they, they know you have to go where you're going. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah. 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 For those of you that haven't done this yet, just it's important to know that FAFSA is free. It's the free application of federal student aid. There is another website that's very similar and looks exactly the same, and then they charge you a fee to process it. So if you get to a point where it says make payment, you're on the wrong site. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, get it in early as much as you can. Make sure that your top school is choice number one. The number one school on the form, that, that school gets all of the information. Two, three, four gets most of it, right? So the institution you really want to go to, make sure it's listed as one because then they can give you the best financial package right out of the gate because we have all of the info, okay? Now, you can also change that. So, and that's kind of part of the deal, right? So label central, they send you your aid, now change it, make Western your top, and you're gonna get the different package because we, they just see different things, right? Fastweb.com is a website you can get outside source uh, web, uh, scholarships and such. Music programs are going to have music scholarships for participation. It's obviously going to vary by institution, um, but there's money everywhere. And then like Doug said, even some, some places might not give you a scholarship out of the gate, but they'll give you money to be a participant once you're there, right? So it's something you can ask when you're there. And that's available for non-majors too at a yes. lot of institutions. You do not need to be a music major to get a music scholarship. Correct. Um, yeah. And you might be surprised if you got one or not. So I would encourage everybody to just try. You're used to auditioning. There's no sense in not just trying. It's one more audition. Correct. I would say this too, if you're looking for outside scholarships like Fast Web and there's some other things out there, create a separate email account because you are going to get pummeled, okay? And for a long time. So it's, it's good to just create a, a secondary account and that's all you use it for, right? Because you'll get everything that comes up, they'll send you stuff. And on those sorts of things, a lot of them are just kind of essay driven. They can be short or long but fill it out, and a lot of them you can use the same essay prompt for the scholarships, but a lot of people will go, oh, three pages, no way. So it's a lot, I got a lot of students that are getting a ton of money from this kind of thing because they were the only one that wrote the, the essay. And they wrote one essay and they got four scholarships. You know? So you know, you, it's something that you can keep up on. There's usually um, requirements that are attached to that scholarship in the music departments, so, so think about that. And usually it's the simple stuff. Make sure that you have good attendance, make sure that you're always prepared. Don't miss the concerts, right? But look at the other obligations. Like there's usually a GPA requirement that you have to maintain, which usually isn't an issue for us. Um, and then other outside performances, right? At the university and college level, we're expected when the president needs a, a band, we have to go play, right? So it's the way we, we keep our students accountable is to say, you have to play in two outside events from the calendar so that when that comes up, we can, we've got a group ready to go. For travel? Do you have, does the like school pay for it? Like say the concerts and traveling across? Usually, usually that's covered. Oh, yeah, no. but again, depending yeah. on where we play graduation and the students receive money for that. Yeah, you know nice. things like that. Yeah. Yeah, going along with the um, maintain a GPA, I could say that for because I'm at I'm under a music scholarship, our music department requires you to maintain a 3.5 yep. or above to keep your scholarship and on top of that there are requirements that you have to meet. So because we have so many different organizations that open, we have this thing for ushering. So our students in the music program, they usher for all these different concerts so that we can maintain cohesiveness throughout each concert. And we use that as like a requirement for your scholarships 
And on top of that, you have to do your service hours where it'd be like, you might help an organization. Like some of you that were, some of the people that are in DYS did the Irish Orchestra through Open University. And I was there helping you direct where you need to go. I was part of the rehearsal. So there's a whole bunch of things that require for your scholarships, but they're not something that's like a burden. Right. Because and a lot of times, if you go to a concert, it's like, hey, I played this instrument in this concert. I'm like, and then you can look and see, can I join this organization? So it's a really good way to network through your different organizations. Yeah. Yeah. Usually not too much more, again, than what we're used to on the time commitment. But again, there's an accountability factor. So that helps us keep everybody on the up and up. These are just some things about, we already know these main things. But you know, college age musicians are emotionally healthier than their non-musician counterparts, right? Um, Music majors comprise the highest percentage of accepted medical students at 66% nationwide. Okay. Music majors score the highest reading scores among all majors, including the English, biology, chemistry, and math majors. Um, so it's that idea. Other stats to know is, you know, if you stay in music in college, you're more likely to graduate in four years and on time, and you're more likely to graduate with up to a 25% higher GPA than your counterparts. We, that's what music does for us, right? It keeps us honest. And you have built-in advisors that way. Your music directors are the same, right? We care about you, and we check in on you, and we, you know, when we know that you're not doing well in another class, even in a different major, I've called students in my office, sat them down, and said, tell me about this chemistry class. How are we going to get you through it? I know nothing about chemistry, right? But I know other chemistry majors in my class that can help them get through that process, right? And I also know that professor really well, so I can call and say, hey, how can we help this student get through? And usually, it's a, we're calling at the same time. So that's just the benefits of, of maintaining music. You know, I know we have to get going. Why don't we do this? <clears throat> Let's break into our ensembles, and then if Jeremy, you could come to the symphony one, and maybe if anyone's got questions, you think you have questions? Maybe we'll just start with uh, that for a couple of minutes. Sure. All right, good. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Major. You guys can ask them on their way out. Please just let me know. And also, we have questions about double majoring. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.